I've done in the past, anybody's been to my talk, I give you, I got 200 cards. Anybody does not have a card? Wow, look at them all. Anybody have more than one card? Would you please share? Because you don't even know which one's the lucky one yet. I got one spare. This is my demo model. Because so you sat in the front row, you're giving me the rest of your chocolate. We're gonna... I'll call you. And uh, so, what's a good pseudo random number generator from uh, 1 to 200? The 200 residue of the last three digits of his serial number on a dollar bill, right? About as good as you can get. So, we'll do, uh, let's see, five of these. I got six NSA glasses. I got some t shirts. And I found a very, very appropriate piece of swag a McAfee virus scraper, <laughs> which I might actually keep for myself because my wife told me that, you know, she's up in Baltimore and it is getting close to 35 inches of snow up there now. It's almost 10 to 12 more than we're getting to DC and it's only 60 miles away. Okay, so uh, first drawing you need to be here, obviously. Okay, 183. It should have just been handed out because that was still in the stack. 183. Oh, come on. Who took the card? There you go. Come on up. What would you like? Trust but verify. Bring your card. Okay, next one. Zero, zero, 007. Oh, come on. If you're not here, you're not here. Shame on you. All right. Well, okay. Let's see. 183. And what would you like? Would you like a glass? Would you like a DEF CON shirt? Would you like uh Oh, by the way, I got NSA activity books. Coloring books, crypto kids. <laughs> Take a duck on shirt. Extra large, large. All right, there you go. Okay, next one. Okay, it's 871, so it'll be 171. No, it's 071, I'm sorry. I got 171. Is 071 here? Okay, you know, you got me on a mistake, so come on. NSA glass, DEF CON shirt. By the way, if anybody's like a really into old stuff, remember the old hacker shirts were always white? 1997 computer security conference, so that's almost old enough to drink. Step time shirts, large, extra large, not the Fed shirt. Don't take all day. <laughs> take a beer. Okay, that's that's wrapped for packing. If you want to drink with it, take one of the ones that's up here for demo. Because I do want to drink with it at home. All right, but not with your friends here. Okay, got it. Okay, next one. Oh, this is cool. Like 999, so that would be 199. Who is the penultimate person to walk in here? See? And you're sitting in the back. What would you like? Hurry up and get a couple more, and then we'll get started. Okay, I got a lot of stuff to go through. Come on up and get it. Uh, next one is 926, so that would be 126. Come on down. 199. And you can get to keep it. Sorry about that. And you have two. You're only supposed to have one. All right, well, I'll tell you what. Here's your 126. You keep that. Who didn't have a card? There you go. Should we disqualify him or let him take something? Here, give me a patch holder. No. <laughs> Grab something fast. You got five seconds. All right, good. You got a doc here. Okay, next one is 264, so that would be 064. 064, 064. You see, I give a few of these things out in advance. And uh, all right, two more, and then we'll get started. Now we're in the good stuff. 029. Somebody met last night. 029. See, this isn't working. You, know, I can be, you have 129? Yeah, let's try the next one. 906, so it'll be 106. Man, this sucks. Okay, glad I do this before the talk, because then we can like edit this all out and no one's gonna see that this is like a fail. Six six six. Okay, so <laughs> that's gonna be zero six six, right? Zero six six here? All right, we're just gonna start doing some talking and uh, then we'll give away some swag a little bit later. Okay, my name is G Mark Hardy. I go by the handle G Mark, sort of eponymous. Oh, what you got? He is indeed the evil hacker. Help yourself. Anything you see up here? Well, not everything. I mean, you can't take my uh, clicker, which is a bad. Unless you bring me a new battery, because I've got a battery, but I'm not going to change it out. Enjoy the beer glass. If you're going to drink here, take one that's unwrapped. Otherwise, take that to, to bring it home with you. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about tales from the crypto. Now, I advertise things about stories you can look up in the library, like World War One and World War Two and things like that. Or I can tell you the ways to win crypto contests. Which would you rather do? Both. We only got an hour. What you rather do? Crypto contest. Okay, I'll, start, I'll tell you these over a beer, all right? So go win something, and I'll tell you over the beer. Talking about military use before World War I, World War II, Enigma ciphers, American, German, Japanese, commercial crypto. Everything before about 1974 was always symmetric cryptography. It wasn't until we developed asymmetric cryptography, i.e. things like public key, that you have one key and another key, and they complement each other. So everything prior to that is what we call classic crypto, and most crypto contests are based on that. Why? 
because you can do them in your head. You can do it with a piece of paper. You can't. You don't have to go ahead and go online and download tools and brute force like you got this little deep crack uh, junior running out here with one of the companies. You guys here? Yeah, a little special purpose uh, uh, card. Going to do a full two to the fifty-six key search in about three days. Pretty awesome. It used to be ninety years. That's what it was estimated when Des came out. So it's basic things in terms of ciphers. Pretty simple. Transposition or substitution. The other ones, the product explanation, explanation we won't cover here. What's the transposition mean? Swap things around. Substitution means put something else in its place. So if I transpose things or move them around, I get a different type of result, but there's some characteristics that remain the same. So if I have to send the message attack at dawn, and I'm using a transposition cipher, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to go ahead and I can load that into, let's say, a 3 by 4 grid. And now what I can do is, depending upon what column I want to select in what order, that becomes my key. So in this particular case, if the key is 1, 2, 3, 4, pretty basic key, but nonetheless, I'm going to pull the stuff from 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, and attack at dawn becomes A, C, D, T, K, A, T, A, W, A, T, N. Somewhat obscure. Now, what's preserved in a transposition cipher? The distribution of letters. What's the most common letter in the English language? E. E, followed by T. T. A, O, N, I, R, S, H, and goes all the way down to uh, J, Q, X, and Z. All right, go read The Gold Bug from Edgar Allan Poe from about 160 years ago. I mean, it hasn't changed a whole lot. And so what we find out about 13 point some odd percent of letters tend to be letter E. And so a transposition cipher, if I use a different key, I get the same population. The most common letters still are preserved. So what you think you can do and when you first get a chunk of cryptography is to say, let me do a frequency analysis. What are there the most of? Hey, there's a lot of Qs. Hmm, maybe Q represents E. If not E, it's probably T. Or it's a, and then you do it that way, and you start to figure out what the pattern is, and then you can start to break it. So crypto usually isn't an all or nothing thing. It's incremental. You find a little toehold, you build on it, and then you constantly build. Occasionally, you might have to stop, back up, go the other way, but it's pretty straightforward. A substitution cipher means we're going to go ahead and we're going to substitute one letter for another. Now, this is called a Caesar cipher. I'm going to show you. Why was it called a Caesar cipher? Yeah, it's not Caesar out in DEF CON who uses it, who throws some of his parties like the. Oh, by the way, yeah, I brought some cool stuff from, from DEF CON. It's still out here. You got another one. Okay, you've got one up there as well. But uh, what a Caesar cipher does is this was used by Julius Caesar back when he was out conquering Gaul and other places like that to send messages back. And what you did is you take the little alphabet, A through Z, well back then of course you'd use the Roman alphabet, so transpose three spaces. So what you do is A becomes D, B becomes E, C becomes F, etc. When you get to the end of the alphabet, you wrap around. So you wrap back, so W goes to Z, X goes to A, then B, then C. And it's pretty simple because they're all still there. 26 letters, going in, 26 different letters going out. But it's a very simple because the key here is what? Three. What, how many different keys can you have in a Caesar cipher? I have 25, yeah, because what happens with key 26? It collapses on top of itself, doesn't it? It comes right back to the message that you had before. So using a key of 26 would not be a very bright thing to do in a Caesar cipher. <laughs> and so, for example, if we had attack at dawn and we shifted everything three places, A becomes... B, C, D, T, U, B, W, W, D, F, N, D. And now you see different letters. You say, hey, wait a minute. In the spoken English language, there's not a lot of Ds and Ws, relatively speaking, but here it's full of Ds and Ws. That would suggest to you that you've got a substitution cipher going on. All right? So if you see a lot of common letters, then it's going to suggest that things have been rearranged, transposition. If you see a lot of frequency of things that aren't common letters, it's a good hint it's a substitution. So that gets you started on one of those two tracks. <laughs> so what happened is, so the problem with the substitution cipher is, is they're pretty straightforward. Because you can actually, you don't have to do them in order. Anywhere we see like the crypto puzzle in the newspaper and a lot of papers that do that, they do that down in Norfolk and things like that. And there are how many possible keys for a substitution cipher? 25. Okay, now that's for a Caesar cipher. But substitution, I've got to remove the requirement that they all shift together. So A can map to 25 other things, right? We're assuming you're not going to map to yourself. That's a dumb thing. So it's 25 ways to map A. How many ways to map B? 
well, 24, because you've already used up one of those spots, 23, 22, 21. So what do you call it? Do you add those or multiply them? What's the product of all the integers from 25 down to 1? 25 factorial. Big number. And yet that number, which is several quadrillion, the average, well, maybe average person could sit there over a cup of coffee and crack that thing in just a couple minutes. How could you have so many keys, quadrillions and quadrillions of keys, and be able to crack that thing trivially? Frequency analysis, exam. You also in them have a lot more information of words they If I have a Bingo, because the most common... One and two letter words that they... Yeah, you know, the most common letter in the English language is E. The most common, uh, if you will, ASCII character in printed text is the space, X20, right? You know, because every word is going to have a space associated with it, except it's the end of the sentence. So you actually get more of those than E's. And so the nice thing about the puzzle in the paper, you get space, space, space. So if you think you know what the, you know, the t, two most common letters are, like a T and an E, and you say, okay, let me guess, I think that the first word ends up being T something, E something, E, what's the word probably going to be? Might be there, right? T-H-E-R-E. -E. And now I can guess H and R, which are fairly common. You have, I substitute down there, and I got the, oh, there's the word her, H-E-R. So there may be something about her. And then you start to crack it very quickly because you're using more than just a frequency analysis. You're using knowledge about the language. And that's what made things very, very difficult back in things like World War II when you needed to have a Japanese linguist to be able to crack the Japanese messages because they're not going to go, or the Germans, we're going to send in, naturally, in Deutsch, right? You're not going to translate your message to your battlefield commanders into your enemy's native spoken language to make it easier for them to break it. The problem with Japanese is how many symbols have you got on a Japanese keyboard? A whole lot. So they had to break them down into digraphs. A digraph is like a pair of characters. So like A, 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 B, A, C, and they would each equate to something. How many digraphs are there out there with just letters? 26 times 26. Come on. 676. So you can, you can represent a lot of different things that way. And again, it helps to have some thought about numbers. The problem, therefore, that we said about a simple substitution cipher is with zillions of keys, you can crack them trivially. So a visionary cipher, about 150 years old, they said, hey, how about if we run parallel ciphers? That is to say, we encrypt every other letter, or every third, or every fourth, or every fifth. Now we've got something that actually might work. So let's say we take the word party, P-A-R-T-Y, which is a good thing to do tonight, right? <coughs> and we'll then go ahead and we'll pick those particular Caesar ciphers. So if my key is P, I'm going to take letter A, increment it, how many places? P is the 15th letter, or 16th letter. So P plus A would be Q. And A, you just add one. And so party, 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 I'll take a message like attack at dawn tomorrow. My keys, I'll break it up into the lengths that I, my key is going to be. So I go party, party, party. So what's A plus P, if you will, mod 26? Well, A is worth one. P, so what comes after P? Q. Okay, T and A, it comes after T. Yeah, all right, interesting. <laughs> Wasn't what it was, yeah, that's a good party, right? <laughs> U, and then when you get to something like C and Y, well, that's going to wrap around the end of the alphabet, isn't it? What's three places after Y? Z, A, B. So we're going to see that this thing, there's your Q, there's your U, there's your B, and now what you're seeing with the substitution cipher is there's five concurrent encryption things going side by side. They're all simple ciphers. And if you got, but it spreads stuff around. So now the U that you get in the first term and the second U don't go back to the original same starting value, do they? One of them is a T in plain text, the other one's an A in the plain text. But because your key keeps changing on a repeating cycle, you can have up to five different things mapped to the same letter in ciphertext. So you might see JJJJJ, and you go, man, what, you know, what's with this five things in a row stuff? It could be a pretty good clue that there might be a substitution cipher going on. It doesn't necessarily have to be a period of five, because the first and the fifth might be the letter E, for example, and it just happens around. What you'll do find, though, is that if you look at this, because this now flattens out that distribution, because now you've got maybe 13% are E's, and if that, if that E maps to like an X, but now you've got four other things, so that 13% is going to get diluted by a factor of five, and now what you're seeing is your ciphertext resembles noise. It has, the information content is harder and harder to see. So one of the things that people say, you say, well, we, you know, we will compress, you know, we'll encrypt and compress your data, and you get great savings. Well, what's the problem with that? If you, yeah, if you, how can you compress random stuff? 
You can't. Because what you're looking for is patterns. The nice thing about English language, if you go to the old zip, when you used to zip files up, why do they compress down 70, 80 percent? Because the information content of the English language is such that you only need about 1.6 characters to represent your language. Because E's happen a lot, and then T's and things like that. And then the Z, you can say, there's also a way to do that in digital signaling called what? Like Huffman coding, right? Or how about Morse code? What's the shortest Morse code? E, dit. What's the, what's the next one? What's the dash? T, did A, A, hmm, dot it, N. Interesting. So you're finding that some of these codes were optimized for the person manually sending a transmission to things that go faster. Now, why is your keyboard a QWERTY keyboard? Why don't we have E T A O N I R S sitting underneath your index fingers, you know, your, your fingers? Because it was jamming the keys. It was jamming the keys when they first built the typewriter. What would happen is that if you type too fast, those little hammers coming up would. Stick. And I'm old enough to remember that from typing class. And you're like, you got them, I'm prime. And so they, they deliberately made it inefficient to slow it down. Now we have a keyboard that speeds it up. What's it called? Dvorak, Dvorak keyboard. When did the Dvorak keyboard come out? Before the right one. No. It's not. 1931. Wow. Yeah. It's not the columnist in PC Magazine. It's been around for a long, long time, about almost 80 years, <coughs> suggesting there's a more efficient way to go ahead and do things. And so that's popular too. When we went to computerize everything, that was our one time good deal chance to say, hey, let's fix all these keyboards. And we all would have figured out we would have standardized on it. But we didn't, so now we're going to be stuck with QWERTY all the way into the generation of Star Trek. <laughs> one more cipher, another cipher I'll show you is something called a Playfair. And this we see from time to time, which is kind of cool. And uh, you've got your badge already plugged in, but uh, I'll talk about that in just a moment. And what a Playfair cipher is, which sometimes they say, if I give a clue that says don't cheat, well, if you don't cheat, you do what? You play fair. It's some basic rules. And what it is is you just take the 26 letters of the alphabet and you usually kind of collapse something out. So instead of either dropping Z, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll say, well, you can just take I and J and make them the same. So a traditional classic Playfair, you collapse I and J together. Well, that's what the Romans used to do anyway. So if you look at some of the old, you know, the J was written as an I, in the old Roman buildings, there's a reason for it. But it wasn't Playfair Cipher. And so what you'll do is you'll tick, pick a key, and instead of going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, A, J, K, L, you'll go ahead and start populating that key into this 25 by 25, or 5 by 5 grid. So you can't repeat the letters, right? Because you're not going to use the same one over. So if I use the key less moose, more crypto, what's the first letter that would be a part of my key? L. So I'd stick that in the first position. And then E. The next letter is S. Well, I've already had an S, right? So I skip that. What's the next letter? M. Then O. Then what's the next letter? Well, did you fit? Yeah, all the way down to R because O, 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 S, C, M, O. So down to R. C, P, and T. And now we've emptied out our key. And what do we pad the rest of it with? Whatever the leftover letters are in the alphabet in order. Hmm, you think there might be a little potential structural weakness in that from a cryptographic perspective. Well, now that they've built this nice little 5x5 five five grid, what do I do with it? Well, the thing with the Playfair cipher is, is there's three simple rules. What I do is I take the two letters that I'm going to try to encrypt, and if they are on the same row, I will just simply take whatever is to the right of each. So, for example, and that first row, L-E-S-M-O, if I wanted to encrypt the letters E and M, I go S-O, because S is just to the right of E, O is just to the right of the M. If I go off the edge, what do you think I'm going to do? Wrap around. wrap around. Don't go down the next layer, just wrap it around. So if I try to encrypt M-O, it'll become O-L. Make sense? And so if I, in the same column, if I'm trying to encrypt E-I, it would become what? CV. And so the last one is, what if they're not in the same row and column? What if they're like corners of a box? Take the opposite corners of the box. So if I'm going to encrypt CN, I would grab PI. Always the first letter in the row, the second letter in the same row. So with those simple rules, you're all set. There's only one little weakness with this. What happens if I get the same letter twice? How do I encrypt LL? What, is that, what does LL become? LL. Well, that's not good because you're now pushing the plain text through. So there's a requirement that when you see a double letter, 
you first pad it. And usually they use an X. And you'll see that also in World War II cryptography. In the U.S., where you'd send a message, and you'd break your words up, and you'd stick X's between them, or Z's between them, or some other very unused character. Why? Because you're not going to use it very often in the real world, and when you need it, you're going to go, oh, okay, I, I guess I needed uh, puzzle, P-U something something L-E. Oftentimes, it would serve as a blank or a filler, and you can drop that out. So if I want to take now is the time for all, good men to come to the age of your country, but we just use that initial prefix, now is the time for all, we'll break them up into pairs because we're going to have to go in that grid by pairs. Well, is there any double letters that you see? Yeah, LL at the end. So I've got to pad the LL with an LX. That pushes the second L into a standalone. I can't encrypt just one letter, so I'll pad that with another X. And now if I go into my grid, what do we get? N-O would be, what's the left, right, Q-M. W-I, look at the grid, and we'll find out that was going to be V-K. Are you seeing this? Can you see that from the back of the room? And so what we'll just go right down the line, when you find a couple things that are in the same row or in the same column, you use that second or that third rule to make sure that you get everything done. And so what you'll then have in a Playfair cipher is a series of digraphs or two-letter codes, and that breaks back out. So one of the things that you'll find out is that in an encrypted Playfair message, can you have the same letter twice in a row? Think, I hear a lot of notes. I hear a yes. Ooh, why yes? It could be the last of one and the first of another. So I had a, a, a contest, and I'll show you to in a minute, that some of the guys who eventually, you know, looking at it, they said, oh, they see a lot of double letters in there, so they said, oh, it can't be a play fair. But they didn't bother to count the position if it's in an odd even. You know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 29, 30, JJ, XX, QQ, you can pretty much reject it. It's a straight play fair. But if it's like the, you know, 10, 11, the last of one, the beginning of another, it could be something else. So now, you know, last one here, and this is typically what you're going to use a Vernam cipher. It could be a one-time pad, but it's also the basis for digital encryption. It uses the XOR function. And your XOR, exclusive or, most people understand what that means, is basically, are they different from each other? Is zero different from zero? No, that's false. Is zero different from one? Yes, it is. Is one different from zero? Yes. Is one different from one? No, it isn't. So it turns out that that unequal sign is the same way to think of XOR. Why is this important? Because if I take anything and I XOR it with a, a keychain, I'm going to get different things that come out of it. Is, so if my message is 01101101, et cetera, and my key is 101001, XORing them together gives me this output. Well, why is this helpful from a digital perspective? If I, yes? If I take, or, or more importantly, when I'm going to decrypt, if I have the same key, what happens when I take plain text, XOR, key, XOR, key? Well, key, XOR, key means either 0, XOR, 0, or 1, XOR, 1, right? What's the result of either one of those? It's got to be 0, right? 0 is not equal to 0. 1 not equal to 1. Both of those are false statements. So now I'm saying the two keys, when they XOR together, always produce a string of zeros. And now, Look at the top two terms. 0 XOR 0 is 0. 0 XOR 1 is 1. So that means that if I take the key and I put it into the key string twice, it zeroes out the key and I get the original message back, which is pretty elegant. And that is a real way you do it at the hardware level when you're going to encrypt things and you have a key stream coming in because XOR is a very easy function to implement in hardware. And so what we'll find is that a lot of digital cryptography is going to generate a key stream, no matter however you get that key stream, and you just XOR it into whatever you're doing, and off you go. So what's the problem, then, if you encrypt the same message or two different messages with the same key stream? It's not a one-time pad. It's not a one-time pad. What you have, then, is the keys drop out and you have an English message or an intelligible message XORed with an intelligible message. Well, guess what? There's no masking here. And if you're just using letters, you can see a lot of E's on E's, right? And E and T and T and E is going to happen a lot more than Q versus X or Z versus J. And so because of that information is preserved, you can go ahead and make some logical inferences, particularly if it's a computer message and it's well formatted. 
like uh, WEP, for example. <laughs> why do wired equivalent privacy not work too well? Because the initialization vector for a lot of the hardware would reset back to zero. And so you start each message with the same set of key stream. Well, if I could intercept a couple messages, XOR them together, the keys drop out, and I've got highly rigid formatted messages where I sort of know from the protocol what to expect. I go, oh, that's that, that's that, that's that. Take that, XOR the plain text back into the encrypted message, and then what do I get? I get the key. And once I have the key, I've cracked WEP, and now I can read all your messages. And that's why I recommend against using WEP, because it's one based on what's really been a very fundamental principle. Don't reuse keying material. So as you look at different ways of doing crypto, and the digital encryption standard, DES, how long has DES been around? When did it become a fifth standard? Oh, come on, let's get a right answer. I'll give you a, give you a t-shirt or something. Anybody? Take a guess. 74? Not 75, not 74. 82. All right, this is going nowhere. 1977, January 15th, 1977. <laughs> Tip sub 45. Ooh, power. And so Des back then said, hey, it's unbreakable. 56 bits. And what you did is it was a very sophisticated way of looking things up in tables. So there is a substitution that moving bits around is a transposition that did 16 rounds. And if you understand enough about mathematics, you understand that those lookup tables had a lot to do with group theory. And so mathematically, it was such that a lot of attacks were postulated against DES. People said, DES is dead, DES has been cracked. What's it really been done? It's been brute forced, right? Now, can you mathematically prove that an encryption algorithm is secure? Can you prove that it's insecure? And you only need one instance to prove it's insecure. But you can never prove it's secure. All you can do is to say, hey, for the last 30 some odd years, nobody has yet to come up with a mathematical proof that shows I can just crack this thing all the time. You've got to brute force all the keys. Well, what did DES in as a good standard isn't the fact that it is a good crypto. The fact that somebody has wrote an algorithm that's been, or a team has wrote an algorithm that's been around for 33 years tells you it's pretty good stuff. But now we can build hardware with special purpose chips that can brute force all these things. You can do tables, look up tables, rainbow tables. You'll hear that term. We already have things that are pre-encrypted. And you can go away. What was one of the uh, projects that was done a few years ago that was designed to go ahead and analyze a huge amount of data but push it out to a lot of other people's computers? SETI. The SETI project, right? Remember, you could download the SETI project. You'd analyze some of this data that was coming out from outer space, and maybe you could find alien life forms. Well, think about it. What a better way, I mean, all these hackers out there, all these people, you're pushing out botnets. So all these botnets out there sending out spam, running to distribute denial of service attack. Why don't we take some of these tough problems and like botnet that out so while your computer's just sitting there idly, it's starting to work on cracking ciphers, like maybe from the bad guys who are going to shoot down the next airplane or something like that. Interesting concept for Homeland Security. Not sure we're going to see that coming out anytime soon, however. But it tells you there's a lot of different ways you can use this stuff. So if you want to win crypto contests, that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about to get you in the, in the mindset here, you've got to start thinking like the person who develops a crypto contest. If anybody here is in law enforcement or does private investigation what do you, or, you, or you watch CSI, <laughs> what do you try to do? Think like your opponent. If you're in the military and you're approaching a battlefield, think like the opponent. You want to go ahead and get inside that other person's head. In this particular case, what are the ways that these things are put together? A lot of crypto contests can't be too, too complicated, like a PDPH badge contest. Anybody remember that from a couple years ago? Because then you go through so many you know, far stretches of the imagination, like, well, who's going to connect those dots? And so what you want is something that ideally goes in stages or allows people to work their way through so you kind of get to a plateau and you go, man, I got that. Anybody uh, wearing a badge? What do you see on those badges in addition to uh, Shmukon 2010? A GP Someone says GPS coordinates. Who told you they were GPS coordinates? You didn't need to be told, right? You just looked at it. And there's a set of four numbers. How many different badges are there out there? I love the well, badges. They're also in the main as well. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, this, this, this reminds me of one of those, like, how many have seen at least four, at least six, at least seven, at least 20? Okay, somebody's seen double maybe. I don't know. So anyway, I've offered uh, to, as, as the contest goes on, 
during the ShmooCon of people getting stuck if we're not making good progress, you can follow me on Twitter, G underscore Mark. Some guy in Japan grabbed G Mark, go figure. So, but G underscore Mark, if you follow me, I'll go ahead and issue little hints and tips and things just to kind of keep everybody level set. That way I'm not giving any one group an advantage. But for example, this particular really cool badge from the Ninja Networks being modeled by this fine gentleman here. You want another one? Are you going to pass these around? Yeah, you can pass it around. Please make sure they come back. And uh, you drop the battery in there, and off it goes. It's encrypting. And so as you play with this thing, it's going to start throwing up random strings of information. But eventually, it's going to go ahead and come out and say, Ninja Party. But it's got other programs in there. You can say, hey, I can change the power level. I can get some information out of it. Ooh, there's a Simon game in there. Remember the Simon game? Press a zero, level one. Can you get it right? Can you push the zero when it's supposed to be a zero? Hmm. All right, rad, awesome. So let's go to level two. And you go through all the levels and things like that, and it's going to start to give you some clues at the end of the badge puzzle. And also printed on here, over on the Bakelite, it's got a whole bunch of little pairs of letters. BNBB, ZQFM, et cetera, et cetera. Does that tell you anything? It's a play fair cipher. Play fair cipher. What clue do you think you get when you get all the way to the end of the Simon game? Play fair. Play fair. How about that? This contest over, kind of, so I'm get, not giving away anything. Did anybody anything. solve this? At Def, did anybody have one at DEFCON? Yeah. Anybody in the room? Did, did, you, did you solve it? Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> did, did anybody solve it without a help? No, I'm curious. Yeah. You solved it? Nice. So, like one person. <laughs> and oh, by, oh, oh, by the way, the key you gave me last night doesn't crack it. Did you do it? Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. So, anyway, the, the key to a Playfair, first of all, you got to figure out what kind of cipher it is. But already in 35 minutes, a lot of you already figured out, oh, I can figure out what that is. Would have saved you a lot of time trying to work through an alcohol haze, trying to go ahead through 10 levels of Simon to go ahead and repeat a sequence back and forth. But then you could go ahead and go right into the, trying to solve the puzzle or look for other clues and things like that. So that's passing on that side. I'll pass this around. Please let me get these back. This is a nice souvenir for me, and I like to show it as exhibits. But it's also something tangible, and you can kind of look at it. Um, so get inside the head of the people who come up with the puzzles. Try to figure out what Caesar does. Caesar does a challenge. Every, I remember Caesar's early challenges. Going into one of the rooms we had over the Alexis Park, the whole wall is set up with butcher block paper, and you're just like, write down thoughts and be well, what if, what if you could do this? Well, how about this? And all of a sudden, you got all these really neat ideas from a lot of really smart people, and he's no dummy. At the end of the party, what do you think he does with them? Takes it back to the office, and someone transcribes them, looks for good ideas you can go ahead and run with. Hmm. So, and as they say, this is recorded right up there in that part of the badge, so you can see that. So in ShmooCon 2008, two years ago, I just came back from Mardi Gras, brought my wife down there. She'd never been down there for Mardi Gras before. It, uh, my wife's a rather attractive lady, so she's up there waving around, and she's just getting beads thrown at her like you wouldn't believe. So I ended up with a 50-pound box of beads. <laughs> had to put, I had to go to Walgreens across the street, get a box, put on the bathroom scale in the, or the scale in the hotel room. Well, of course, you can't see it, so what do you do? Put the garbage can on it upside down, and then put the box on the garbage can and subtract the weight of the garbage can, right? And then you can figure out, okay, it's 49 pounds, so that United Airlines is gonna, not going to charge you the extra 50 or 100 bucks and haul this thing back. Well, what is it, what's going to happen? That stuff's going to sit in the closet for 20 years or 50 years, and my kids are going to, you know, someone's going to give away after I'm dead. like, what the hell is this stuff around? So I brought it to ShmooCon. And so I did what any normal person would do. I created a contest. Wouldn't you? After this talk, perhaps you would. And so I also have friends with too much free time. And so they did some really cool graphics. And they decided to call it Hardy Gras. And... Uh, I ended up not using either of these, but this one I think I did use, and we stuck that around. So some of you might have remembered that cat. I'm in your beads, breaking your ciphers, so you can kind of figure out that, hey, there's something going on with those beads. And a bunch of people ended up with strings of beads in their schmoo packets. Also, a bunch of people ended up with some particular piece of crypto information, like a little slip of paper. It wasn't always the same person. So the idea was I wanted to get people to talk to each other. Hey, it's a, it's a hacker contest, okay? Extroversion is not a job requirement in this line of work. A lot of times it's kind of a recessive trait. And so I want people to go talk to people and exchange ideas and things like that. And so I had a couple cohorts with me, Lost, who does the puzzles out in uh, DEF CON, uh, Kay and uh, Mouse. We carried around extra strings of red beads. And we, kind of, we placed these messages in here. And there's the plain text. 
So I've already done the work for you. I'm going to, here I'm going to build a contest for you. Congratulations on your opportunity to join our first Wukong Crypto Conundrum. Your first task is to find participants with strings of Mardi Gras colors only. Warning to you, do not show up with anything pink or you disqualify instantly. Because remember, we had a whole bunch of pink beads out there. Bring your strings to a man or woman who has a string that is the color of blood and you will obtain an important hint that will assist you in solving a first round. Notice anything unusual about that hint? Well, yeah, but well, the beads came in all different colors. So, I, I mean, they'll just throw whatever they got at you. We got, I still got little stuffed animals that my dogs have adopted. Color of blood. A color of blood. A color of blood. Why would, they, why would someone say a color of blood? Why not just say red? Oh, E? What about an E? No E's in any sentence? Isn't that evil? Oh, the guy from, uh, from uh, Google who has been working on this, he just came up and says, you are evil. He said, they've been trying to substitute, okay, the, every letter in the ciphertext, trying to substitute it to E, and of course it didn't work. Because this is called a lipogram. A lipogram is when you deliberately leave out one or more letters out of your text. There is a book called Gadsby, written by Ernest Vincent Wright, who wrote the entire book with the key, back in the old keyboard, tied down so you could not hit the letter E, you could not strike. And in a 50,000-word book, which actually reads, you know, reads like a novel, has no letter E in the entire thing. Okay, and that then serves as a really good hint for crypto puzzles. I know Lost a couple years ago used that as one of the keys for it, as you had to go ahead and pull some text out of a book, and it had no E's that were enciphering with it. So what you end up with is a plain text. I'm going to pad it. I'm going to put letter Z's in between each of the words so I can break them up to make it a little bit easier for you to figure that out. And again, that was traditional back in World War II to use that Z when you're encrypting messages. And if you've got extra spaces at the end, because I want to make them 80, because what? I'm printing them out on those 80-column cards that you had. But in this case, I was printing them on pieces of paper. So that's another thing you might see, see as a theme with <coughs> contests. 80 shows up a lot. And uh, now I use some Caesar ciphers. Caesar ciphers are easy to break. Round one, you want to let a lot of people kind of figure it out. So there's five different lines of 80 letters, which is plenty of text, and the first line is with set offset of seven. What letter is seven? G. G. What letter is 13? M. M. What letter is eight, one? A. What do you think 18 is? R. Okay, what letter is lever? G-M-A-R-K. Wow, how about that? And so my little eponymous... Key, that's the ciphertext, and that's what went out in people's bags. And that was round one. And so what happened is you got a little clue that looked like this, and I just threw in a whole bunch of little random quotes on there. I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. Um, the greatest good you can do for another is not just to share your riches, but to reveal to him his own. And then I had a couple little poems in there. Hmm. If you do not schmoo, it's too bad for you. Oh, yes. You are one of the few. If you can't see the clue, give it to somebody else. Because I didn't have enough clues for everybody because I didn't know that not everybody's going to go ahead and play a badge contest. Well, a few teams, several teams actually, figured out that first round. So what they did is they came up to one of the four of us wearing the red beads and they said, hey, here it is, and what do we have to do? Show up with anything pink. Bring your strings. So you had to come up with a purple, a gold, and a green. Mardi Gras colors. Exactly. But if you had a pink, you poisoned it. So if you tried to brute force it, you fail. And that was the reason that was in there. So if someone just said, hey, let me give you one of each, that doesn't work. But if you got it, then I gave you a red bead string. Well, what's the problem now? All the judges have red beads, and so do the people who have cleared round one. So if you're slow at clearing round one, and you go up to somebody with red beads, they might be a judge, they might be your competition. And if they're your competition, you think they're going to reward you and say, oh, no, take my red bead, please. Or they're going to send you back to the drawing board. You're going to go, well, okay. Or you can figure that out and say, hmm, this thing is starting to dilute the pool of valid resources, so let's go ahead and be careful about that. And so, again, all these little nuances that are put into puzzles to give you a first mover advantage. The faster you solve round one, the more likely you were to be able to head, move on to, to round two. And so what you handed is you got this little rebus that a friend of mine made up. What, what do you think this means? Rebus being a little puzzle with kind of words and symbols and colors and pictures. Ready for more. Ready for more. Well, is it, a, is it a full visit or it's kind of a, it's a short visit? 
What comes after a short visit? To see. And this is a talk I gave that year, A Hacker Looks Past 50. And the last one is kind of interesting. I didn't come up with this, and it took me a while to figure it out. But what word do you think it is, but it's missing four letters? O something, E R something, T something, O something. Operation. Operation. But what letters are missing? P A I N. So it's a painless operation. All right. And so what that basically said is go to G Mark's talk, and he's going to hand out all these cards. And so round two was handing out all these little cards. Okay, because in 2007, I talked about a hacker looks at 50. Well, no one wants to hear about what happens when you turn 51, and you can't go like, oh, okay, how about a hacker looks at uh, 0x33? Now, that wasn't compelling, so I said, oh, just go past, past 50. And hand out the punch card, very much like the cards you have now, with a little puzzle down there. Again, 80 characters, 40 across, 40 down. 80 column cards. These cards, by the way, are originals. This job deck has been in Mom's Attic since 1975. If you smell them, it still has the, the residue of Mom's Attic smell. Uh, that'll go away eventually, I think. But uh, that's the job that I had from when I was a kid, and I uh, kept them around. So the Playfair cipher, what I call a don't cheat cipher, because what happens if you went to the uh, A in there, oh, it can't be Playfair, but it wasn't an odd even. It was an even odd. It was along the divide. And that tripped up a couple teams because they rejected it out of hand, because they didn't take the time to be diligent. Cryptography requires looking at the detail, but you'll reveal an awful lot in that detail. So we have a hacker looks past 50. What's the key going to be? A, H, we already got an A, C, K, E, R, L, O, got an O, already got a K, got a K, you know, S, et cetera. And hacker looks past 50. Okay, so here we go. And then we do what? We just pad it with the rest of the alphabet. And we got our Playfair cipher. And so now, by the way, the encrypt, if I move to the right, what do you think decrypt is? Move to the left. If I move down, I move up. And if I take opposite corners, I'll take same opposite corners. Just reverse that. And so it turns out that the Playfair cipher breaks out really quickly. And a couple of teams got this. But now we've noticed that we got a, large, you know, a lot of people were round one. Not so many people finished that. Not so many people. So it became decreasing. The difficulty level went up. But every tool in this crypto puzzle is something I've covered in the last 40 minutes. So, basic moves. Go ahead, email Marty Grotch, wukon.info, for the first of four pieces of the round two puzzle. And each of these cards, by the way, could, you could break them on their own. So you might not have all four clues, but you had to get all four clues. Again, I wanted you to have to be social, go out and make friends, and, hey, mine's different from yours, or yours is the same, I don't want yours and then put the messages together. Try to find www.schmoocon.info slash beadsecret. Why would I say try to find? Well, because it turned out it was an unresolvable URL. It was a redirect to gmarkhardy.com, and at which point it would break, but you go, oh, it's a redirect. Let me just add the um, bead secret after that, and it works. Dial the Aloha state. What state is that? Hawaii. Hawaii. I had a, I was, my uh, reserve assignment those two years was out in Hawaii, so my cell phone had an 808 phone number. And then if you do the math, you know, 808-954-9233, and you got a recorded message that would give you the third tip. And sometimes the easy way to get what you want is just ask the nice person you might three times nicely. So if he actually came up to me and asked, could I have the fourth secret? Hello. Can I have the fourth secret? Hello. Can I have the fourth secret? Here it is. <laughs> so again, we pad those for encryption, which means I'm going to go ahead, because it is a play fair, when I have a double letter that appears in an odd even position, like the word shmookon on the top line, all the way to the right, S-H-M-O-X-O-C-O-N, I stick a letter in there. And you notice it kind of fell off the right edge, like puzzle, I lost the E at the end, or going, I lost the G, but you can figure that part out. Encrypt it with the play fair cipher, and now you'll see a lot of paired letters. But those are all in an even odd position. And then you go, okay, that does not disqualify this from a Playfair. Because you can't have double letters in the odd even positions. And if you do each task, in the autoresponder, you get an email back that would say, this is the first clue, T-A-W-S-A-G-K-G-M-I-E-5-4. Send another email to the same domain using the numbers you find in the clues, if you get them all, and in the right order, and the fourth hint will be given to you. Hmm. So what happens is you got to get the clues. The second one, my hat's off to you. You solve puzzle two. Here's some more. 
don't delay. Third clue, you call the voicemail, you get the message, Echo, Indio, Romeo, Oscar, Tango, Alpha, you know, eight, one, eight, out, and it hangs up. And then the fourth clue, if you go ahead and you take all these messages together, they put together like that. And it turns out the number was 571428, and if you sent an email autoresponder to 571428 at schmoocon.info, it would send you back the last piece of the puzzle that you needed to solve it. Because you notice the first three clues have the numbers in it. The fourth piece is what you're looking for. And so I said you could brute force it. Did you use this, find this with ease or use the force of a brute? Either way, solve the puzzle and collect your loot. So it turns out that if you put them all together with that missing piece, and now just take the stuff and read top to bottom, okay? T-H-E-M-A-G-I-C, the magic words to say to G-Mark are, give me white beads. And I thought that was reasonably good contest, because I still had, it didn't have a whole lot of white beads, but people could wear them and say, hey, like I solved the puzzle. Well, uh, Team Chicago solved it. Any of you guys here? Any Team Chicago minus? Yep, you're here. One of the guys who was not on the team, he kind of backed out of the team for whatever. So anyway, I had planned, because that was the year they had this badge puzzle where they had a PDP-8 punch card, and I kind of recognized the old punch because it was paper tape, five columns, you know, one, two, four, eight, sixteen. So it was kind of a strange base. You had to run the PDP-8 program. If you ran that program, it produced an output. You then had to run that through an Enigma machine with a certain variant of the Enigma machine. You got to, it was like, come on, who's going to get there? This seemed a little bit more reasonable. And so I was going to get like one, and then and if you got it, you got like an eight gig memory stick. So I said, hey, I'll give somebody a scholarship to go to DEF CON. Well, it turns out four people want it. So what am I going to do, right? Well, me being me, I bought an all round trip plane ticket to DEF CON because I thought that'd be pretty cool if you're somewhere in your 20s and someone says, hey, here you go, just come to DEF CON, scholarship. And <laughs> then you don't have to wait in line to get your badge either. Took care of that on that end. So when I got to DEF CON, Jolly and company spent their time trying to solve Wasp puzzle instead of mine because I handed things out a little crypto puzzle. At the closing ceremonies, like any hints, and I think you remember, I texted you back, start saving your money for next year's plane ticket because you didn't solve it. Uh, by the way, that 2008 DEF CON puzzle remains unsolved. And I don't know whether it was unsolved because it was too difficult or it was unsolved because people were really drinking a lot or they wanted to win lost puzzle because you got a black badge and you got to come back for free forever. So maybe just getting a free round trip plane ticket wasn't enough to bribe people. So anyway, the uh, DEF CON 2008 contest, I retreaded it because I hate to waste stuff. And those are the five, so you already got a hint already, there's five different types of badges or, or computer cards out there. So if, you, if you're really fast typist, you can copy all that down, or you can go ahead and make some friends and put it in there. But everything you've heard in the last 46 minutes are all the tools you need to figure this stuff out. It's not that difficult. Somebody's taking a little cell phone picture. Good for you. All right. Back to Shmuka. So remember these badges from last year? What was that all about? Torture, yeah, especially because they made a mistake on the eighth badge. You have in the upper right-hand corner instead of da 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 or da 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 I put an extra dit in there. But there's only one letter screwed up. So as you know, they have kind of barcode, schmar code. I was sitting over at Bruce and Heidi's house and their uh, dining room table. I was like, we've got to come up with something for these badges because we've got to get them off for the printer in a couple days or tomorrow or whatever. So I just whipped something up. And I thought, hey, I, just, I was just reading a book that a friend of mine had given me because uh, the guy who uh, runs... The Coffee Wars at DEF CON, FUFUS, which is a great social engineering hack, by the way. Think about it. The contest is you bring the best coffee from around the world you can find, and we'll grind the beans, and we'll, we'll taste it, and whoever wins, you know, wins the, the contest. Well, you got to have bring a pound of beans. Well, what happens with the rest of the beans? He takes them home. And you only know, used about two or three ounces of the beans, so he ends up with like 20 really good high-end coffees, almost a pound of each, and that gives him free coffee for the rest of the year. <laughs> Way to go. So anyway, I'd been back, as I mentioned, I was out in Hawaii. I was working out there, um, lots of trips back and forth. So I brought back uh, my special Kona blend that I really liked. And it won. It beat 23 other things, some a lot more expensive. And I thought that was pretty cool. But I like it. In fact, I still, that's all I drink at home. Um, anybody from up near Canada knows that you got Tim Horton's coffee. Um, Chris loves that. My son loves that. And uh, we got some, and it turned out that pff, I can't drink it anymore. I guess I get spoiled with the good stuff. And so anyway, we had Morse codes and barcodes. The barcodes are tough to read. Why? Because we print them in an angle, and then the resolution turned them into these. And therefore, people trying to do a quick barcode read couldn't do it. It turned out the iPhone barcode reader read them like that. A lot of other people had a hard time. But you can break them by hand. They're not that difficult, OK? They're all digits. 
And it turns out that if the left border and the right border and the barcode, they all look like that. We're, anybody know Morse code? My dad used to do high-speed Morse code intercept back in the Korean War, so I kind of learned at a young age to do that and ham radio and stuff like that. It's always sort of a lost art. But it's an alphabet, and it's very easy to look up. And so if you look up the left border and you look up the right border, and then you either scan the barcode or you kind of learn how to eyeball it, because you can see there's an awful lot of commonality. I wasn't going to take the time to make them perfectly line up on this slide. But you can see there's a lot of core stuff that looks awfully a lot alike. You'll find out that these are the values. And I put them in order to make it a little bit easier. Well, what are we seeing here in terms of information? If we go left to right, M-O-O-S-L-E-T-O-E-H-W, hmm, mooseltoe, uh, moosel defense, chocolate moose. Kind of a theme in here, right? Musketeers, room with a moose. How about in the barcodes? What do you see as a theme? One, one, one. Two three five eight one three two one eight. What? Fibonacci. Fibonacci. What's Fibonacci? For those who don't know, it's a mathematical sequence where each term equals the sum of the two previous terms. <coughs> one plus one is two. So one and two are three. Two and three are five. Three and five are eight. Five and eight are thirteen, and so on. How many terms of the Fibonacci sequence are in these barcodes? Count them. How many? Because they're all the same in the middle. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. Eight of them, right? Ooh. Eight characters on the left border, eight characters on the right border, eight terms of Fibonacci series, eight different barcodes. You're starting to see some commonality here. Again, you want to get inside the head of the person who comes up with these puzzles. A lot of internal consistency is a useful thing because if you get three out of four, maybe you can interpolate the fourth because you say, hey, these all have this sort of thing in common. And so if you take these things and you go, okay, one through eight was so you could order them in a particular sequence. Why would the messages have to be in any particular order? What have you seen that represents an order? Someone said it a minute ago. We got like short-term memory loss? Fibonacci sequence, right? You're going to put things in order perhaps. So what you do... And oh, by the way, what's those rightmost numbers and people trying to figure that out? That's a valid checksum, okay? So it's a legit barcode. That's what it would be if you go through the barcode checksum routine. And so those middle numbers, the fib numbers, here's your table of values. And in there you have all these little fun messages, mooseltoe and moosey fate and moose nugget and things like that, but a lot of extra letters on the end. So one of the guys called them telomeres. What's a telomere? Any biology students out here? extra stuff at the end of a DNA chain that doesn't participate in what the actual instruction sequence is. Okay, it's like the slack space at the end of a file because files are going to go in certain cluster sizes and if you only have a 10-byte file, it's going to have whatever's left over in there. So you got a bunch of telomeres in there, HWX, JB, RG. You see any patterns in those telomeres if you put them in orders one through eight? Oh, did you see anybody see GMARC? Over here on the right? Wow, how about that? Anybody ever watch, uh, ever read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah, Slaughter Bartfast, the guy who made the fjords, put his picture there. And, you know, designers autograph stuff. But that's a weakness sometimes. It's an advantage if you're trying to solve a puzzle, but it's also a weakness because a lot of times people have problems putting their ego aside. And if you're actually building a real live no kidding security system or whatever, there might be something that refers back to the owner. Almost like when you're trying to do password guessing in social engineering, you're going to try to figure things out like that. Also, by the way, this is another name that came up. I was rather surprised. Uh, if you see Jesus in there, it was an apparition. It was not part of the design. It just happened to show up that way. So God works in mysterious, <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. Yeah. And so these are the telomeres. Those are the leftover characters. And if you look left to right, you'll start to see things that you could make sense. Now, I don't know if anybody was going to in intuitively get this, but you can't start building a word with HW or HX, but BR, hey, that's a common BRS, no, BRU, BRUC, ooh, BRUCW, B B Bruce. Hey, Bruce is in there. Heidi, I spelled her name wrong, my fault. And then I put XO at the end because, well, they're married. And uh, so what's left? How many letters are left? Yep, yeah, HWXJ, SXZW, OJYN, ZMBT, 16. Whoa, could that be significant? How many letters long are each of the puzzle clues? 16. 
What do I do if I've got 16 things and 16 numbers? Well, what do I do? You know, and I've also got eight numbers and eight fields. <coughs> what if I start combining them? Got that Fibonacci series, right? What if I have the first row start with one, the second row start in the first position, then the second, then the third, then the fifth, then the eighth, then the thirteenth, and I just apply that shift to it. And I shift them around just a hair. That's the Fib series. And so now I'm going to take the first one. This comes a little bit off the edge of the screen there, but uh, you can see it over here on the left. You know, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. And I shift this one, shift that 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. 21 goes all the way around and wraps around. Again, another thing you'll see an awful lot with crypto is modular arithmetic. You get all the way up to 26, or up in this case up to 16, or up to 256 or whatever, and you'll loop back around again because you can't go up over the top. And so what you get then is you shift all these things around and you get all those messages. And I've left those in the orange, the telomeres that seem to have information in them. I've marked them in green. So what's left over is in blue. What do you see? Do you see any pattern with the stuff that's left over in blue? They line up how? One per column, right? <coughs> Why would there be one per column? Maybe, maybe, it, yeah, maybe it needs to balance the columns somehow. So when you think modular arithmetic, if you're thinking with letters, letters equate to what when it's easier to work with? Numbers, right? A is 1, B is 2, C is 3. Because it's tough to say what's M plus M, but it's really easy to say what's 13 plus 13. And so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and turn them all into numbers. And now let me just add up each column and see what I get, because I've shifted them the correct amounts. And so the sum of those columns are going to be 113, 102, 92, blah, blah, blah. Well, what do I do with a number that's bigger than 26? I modded 26. I keep chopping out 26s until I get something that's left. And the numbers I get back mod 26, 9, 24, 14, 1, 25, 0, 15. OK, well, what's the ninth letter of the alphabet? I. Close. 24th. Z minus 2. Z minus 2. X, right? I, X, 14th, N, A. Any words you can think of that begin with I, X, N, A? No. How about the next letter? 25. Y. I, X, N, A, Y. Is that a word? X, N, A. Whoa. And zero just might be a space because it doesn't equate to anything. And it turns out that if you convert those things back using 1, 2, 3, up to 26, and there's your code. It equates to the solution, which if you got it right, you got a free pass to come here to ShmooCon this year. It was Ixne on Usme. <laughs> and so that was last year's contest, and that's how it was solved. So what kind of sick mind comes up with stuff like that? Well, those are my notes. I found my notes. I said, Bruce, you got any graph paper? He went and downloaded a piece of graph paper and printed it. It's like, OK, I, like, I actually I still have a pad of old graph paper from high school somewhere in the bottom drawer. But, and that, that was, those are my original notes and uh, coming up with a puzzle. So that was, again, about 45 minutes worth of just fiddling around and then trying to figure out the balance and things like that. And that's how you get with puzzles. And it's the same sick mind that uh, came up with maybe this pledge puzzle, which happens to have some numbers and digits and things like that in there. And uh, so if you ask around, and you might have a clue if you count the number of images here, and then follow me at G underscore Mark on Twitter, I'll start issuing you some clues so you can go ahead and start finding out some information about that. So I've got cool stuff. Someone's writing down the numbers. But just look around. Look at other people, okay? If, if it's an attractive lady, be very careful where you stare. You might get slapped. But uh, if you can probably do it diplomatically and, uh, and read her numbers. And that's Tales from the Crypto. But, thank you. But wait, there's more. I'll stick around for questions, but let's get rid of some of this. So, there goes my money clip. Tough getting old. All right, check your badges or check your, your cards. If you have anybody has number 014. 014. Going, going, gone. Oh, got it. All right. Come on up and grab something. 301. So that's 001. Who was the first person I gave one to? Shame on you if you're not here. 001. Okay, one one three. 
That, I, I, I'm going to take all this stuff home. I have to. 615. So that's going to be 015. Nobody? 698. So 098. What the hell? Anybody want to buy a, a glass for 10 bucks or 5 bucks? <laughs> 261. So that would be 061. 191. That's, all right. 191, come on down. 195. All these people the last minute. So if you already left and you got 195, shame on you because it's not even 1 o'clock yet. Shift one. Shift 1, okay. 872. You've got uh, your glasses. Take one. Or you can have a t-shirt. I think it's a lady's shirt here, but it's extra large. No, uh, someone else. This is a sleeveless shirt. Or you can get some. Yep. Or you want your glasses. Or you can take some cool stuff here. Yes, you may. It's my 1997 t-shirt. So this is an old, ancient classic. Yeah. By the way, this was the um, 1997 computer security event. Enjoy that. I don't want to see it on eBay for like ten thousand dollars. Like, well, it's the only one remaining. Okay, I got two more glasses left up here. Seven two two. So number one two two. You got it. All right, come on down. Close enough. Get up here. Come on, I get out of here. You like a beer mug? All right, there you go. Enjoy. Two seven zero. So that'd be zero seven zero. Okay. Six four eight. So zero four eight. Come on. Okay. Think of a number from 1 to 100. Anybody want a DEF CON t-shirt? Hey, we got one more of these. Should be floating around. Do you still have it? Please don't walk out. Yeah, thank you. I got a Not the Fed shirt from uh, DEF CON 2000. So this is a 10-year-old brand new unworn shirt. Got to tie these things in knot because of the air. All right, close my eyes, right? Where to go? Throw the beer glass. Throw the beer glass. I'm not going to throw the beer glass. Um, this is a Jinxwear hacker shirt, black golf shirt, worth about forty bucks. Oh, that's too good to throw out. Let me stick another number here real quick. Here we go. Six one one. So zero one one. You got it. All right. Come on down. Here, see if I can sidearm it under this low ceiling to you. All right. And I'll tell you what, so I don't waste anybody else's time. I got one beer mug. Buy me a beer tonight, and I'll give you the glass. Yeah, I got a challenge coin.